Sweet. So today we are finally, because last week we wrapped up the prologue, we are finally getting to the narrative portions of the Gospel of John. So in the prologue, the first 18 verses, we've spent the last four weeks on that. And we've been studying a really good summary in John's mind of what the gospel is, uh, of the deity of Christ, of his power as the uncreated creator, of his relationship to the world, even before the world, um, even before he was in the world, and of the fact that in general, the world and even those that he called his own people rejected him, but to those who did receive him, they gave the, he gave the right to become the children of God. And we saw a little bit last week about John the Baptist, and we're going to pick back up and learn more about him today. But who remembers one of the qualities of John that we talked a little bit about last week? We were in John chapter 1 and verse 15, and there was something about John and his understanding of who he was that's really informative in John chapter 1 and verse 15. Did they take um, notes on that part? Well, we talked about his humility. His humility, that's right. His humility. He he knew what his role was, and he knew that even though he kind of he came, his ministry started before Jesus' role, his job was to point to Christ because Christ was ultimately was ranked before him. So he had a very successful ministry from a worldly point of view, and yet um, he didn't see it that way. He saw it is that his only role was not to be successful in numbers or baptisms or professions or any of these things that we like to count um, these days. His only job was to point to Christ. So we're going to actually see that today as we dive in. We're going to be in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. Now there's uh, five of us here. So how about um, I'll just call on some of y'all to read. We've got other passages that we're going to read today, too. So I'll go in order here. Katie, if you will please read for me John chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. That's the first paragraph that we'll look at. And then, Matt, if you'll read the second paragraph, which is 24 through 28. And then I've got lots more for uh, Lauren and Alyssa to read, too, when it's their turn. Go ahead, Katie. Great. Perfect. So verse 19, and this is the tes testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. I am not, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Very good. So this starts off by saying this is the testimony of John. Now we've got the benefit of the extra biblical subheadings in our modern English translation. So you kind of maybe already know this answer, but when, it's, when, when we're in the Gospel of John and it uses the name John, which John is, are we talking about? John the Baptist or John the Evangelist who wrote the Gospel? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, very good. Because every time we see the word John, it, it, John who wrote the Gospel of John doesn't call himself by name. If you all remember from like week one, he always calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's sort of like his way of saying, I'm not important here. The only thing you need to know about me that's important is Christ. So here we're talking about John the Baptist. And John, John the Baptist is giving a testimony. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, um, in verse 7, 
we said it says he came as a witness. This is, was also referring to John the Baptist. He came as a witness, and that was a legal term. Now, this is his actual witness, his confession. This is his testimony. This is like a legal testimony about who Christ is. It says, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So we got we to gotta think a little bit about what John the Baptist has been doing. He's, he's come out here to the Jordan River, and now that we're in the narrative portions of John, I get to draw more pictures and stick figures. He's come out here to the Jordan River, and there's crowds of people. I mean, they're just everywhere here to hear John preach and to be baptized. And he's standing over here, and you can probably imagine he's got the goat hair, clothes on, he's snacking on locusts and wild honey, and he's kind of a weird dude, but he's out there in the wilderness, and he's doing something that the Jews didn't normally do. He's baptizing. But I want to be clear here. He's not just baptizing. He's saying, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, baptism was not an unusual thing at the time. That didn't start in the Acts when the New Testament church came around and Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ. John says, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. There's, a, there's somebody coming, and I'm here to prepare the way for him. And for you to get ready for that, you need to repent and be baptized. And so people were coming in droves to do that. Well, baptism was actually a normal part of, uh, of, of Jewish order, of what they normally did in the temple. What happened was if, if there was a Gentile, somebody who was outside of the covenant community of the Jewish faith, if they came and they were converted to Judaism, they became what they called a proselyte. A proselyte, which is just somebody who has, is, is new to the religion. They, they've come into Judaism from outside. And if you come into Judaism from outside, part of the process, part of the rites that you would go through would involve a baptism. It was a symbolic cleaning of the uncleanness of your former life as you're being baptized into this new faith, into this new covenant. Now, this would only happen to Gentiles. It would not happen to Jews or to the children of Jews because they were already in the covenant. It would only happen for Gentiles. And even Gentiles, let's say two Gentile parents became proselytes, they became Jews through this process, their children would also not need to be baptized because they were already clean in that respect. But that's not what John the Baptist was doing. He was baptizing even Jews, men, women, and children, saying that you need to repent and be baptized. That's, that's not right in, in the eyes of the ruling class of, of the Jewish religion at the time. That's not how we do things around here. And in, in fact, if somebody was to, to change that, they would need to have authority to change that. And so they need to question John. They need to say, look, we got to ask you who you are, because if you're doing this, you need to be somebody who has the authority to do that. So they came to him and they asked him five questions. What are those five questions? Let's see if I can squeeze them in over here. Who are you? Who are you? Yeah, see, this, this is easy. You're just going to go down the list. We're going to write them up here on the board. The first question is just real simple. Who are you? What's the next question? Are you Elijah? Are you Elijah? What in the world? All right, what's the next one? Are you a prophet? Are you, does your say a prophet or does it say the prophet? I'm sorry, the prophet. Yes. Ah, very good. Now there's a, we're going to get into that distinction. Some translations will actually have a capital P prophet. So I'm going to write it capital like this. Uh, what's the fourth question? You'll see it down in verse 22. What do you say about yourself? What do you say about yourself? about yourself. Man, I can't write today. What do you say about yourself? And then what's the fifth question? It's way over in um, verse 25. 
And why are you baptizing? Why are you baptizing? Notice they didn't really get to the problem that they were worried about until the very last question. But we're going to start up here at the top. Who are you? And, and his response is very short. His response is very short. What does he say in response? So who are you? I'm not the Christ. I am not the Christ. Now, he could have said, my name's John. But he didn't say that. He, he, he could have said a great number of things. He could have said, I'm the last of the Old Testament prophets. He could have said, I'm a man of God sent to tell you, repent and be baptized. The kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> Make straight the way of the Lord. He didn't say any of that. They said, who are you? That's the tone we kind of need to have in our heads. They kind of bustle up to John, all authoritative looking, and say, hey, who are you? And he goes, wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's go back to what's really important here. I'm not the Christ. Okay, so he, he kind of knows probably what they're thinking in their head. And he doesn't talk about himself. He talks about Jesus. He says, I'm... I'm not Jesus, so don't get confused. Then they come back to him. Oh, I, I will say this. It says he confessed and did not deny, but confess. This is a very um, Hebraic way of saying things. This sort of points to what Hebrew poetry looks like sometimes. Like uh, English poetry, it rhymes. It has iambic pentameter and all the weird things that we do with, with poetry in, in English. In Hebrew, Poetry was all about parallelism and opposites. Hebrew poetry, like in Proverbs and Psalms um, and other parts of the Old Testament, it doesn't just not rhyme in English. It doesn't rhyme in Hebrew either. It's always about parallelism and opposites. And so here it says, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. And it's sort of like saying both sides of this. He emphatically said, I am not the Christ. So in verse 21, they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Well, that's a weird question. Why would they think that he was Elijah? Is it because... We're expecting... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, is it because Elijah ascended into heaven? Okay, that's a good guess because, because that is what happened. So like if, if he didn't actually die, maybe he could come back, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. how about you, Matt? Yeah, I was going to say something similar. I, I think the, the Jews were expecting his return or uh, a return of an Elijah figure, the prophet in association with the Messianic prophecies. That's right. That's right. They are expecting an Elijah, and rightly so, but not in the way that they're thinking. So turn with me to the book of Malachi. If you're, we're, we're, we're in John, that's in the New Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. In my Bible, Katie, you've got my Bible too. We're going to be on page 803. And we're actually going to read the last two verses of the entire Old Testament. This is as, this is as, as late as you can get in the Old Testament before the 400-year intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testaments, the, the 400 years silence of God, and then the coming of John the Baptist, which is what these two verses is actually talking about. So I'm going to read. Uh, I'm not going to read. I told you y'all were going to read. Lauren, you're next on my list. Lauren, if you'll read for me Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Sure. So behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Very good. So in this chapter, in chapter four, Malachi is prophesying about the coming of the day of the Lord. This is talking about the return of Christ. This is talking about the, the end of times. And when it says the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, he starts in verse one of chapter four, for behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. 
That day is coming that will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave neither root nor branch. It sounds like a great and awesome day to me. And he's, he's trying to also encourage the righteous about how they will, um, they will win out in the end in that case. And, and tells them in verse 4 what to do in the meantime. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded you at Horeb for all Israel. In the meantime, be doing what I've already told you to do. And then he says, and this is what you should look forward to in verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, the priests and the Levites who have sent these messengers to come and talk to John the Baptist have taken a very literal translation of this, that Elijah would come as, um, as, as sort of a resurrected person or a reincarnated person, or since he actually didn't die, he was carried off by chariots of fire, that he would just come back down like he left, and he would come back down in that way. And so they say, are you Elijah? And John's answer John's familiar with this passage. He knows what they're talking about, and he knows it points to himself. And yet his answer, I hope you kept a finger over in John. What is his answer in verse 21 of John chapter 1? I am not. I am not. Sorry. That's, that's right. His answer <laughs> is no. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Now, wait a minute. He knows that he's the one being sent in the spirit and power of Elijah that's prophesied in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. But he just goes, no. He's not actually lying here. He's responding to their understanding of that verse, that they've taken a very literal tra uh, translation of that verse, a literal interpretation. And remember, he knows his job is not to talk about himself. His job is to point to Christ. And he's going to get to that in just a minute. But what he doesn't want to do is spend time debating their misinterpretation of that verse. So he very simply just says, no, I'm not that guy. Well, they're not happy with that answer either. So in verse 21, he said, I'm not. They said, are you the prophet? Now, Alyssa, yours says the prophet, right? Yes. Does anybody say anything other than the prophet in chapter one? Because it should. It's, it's a singular, very specific the prophet. Now, when I was studying this, I thought I knew who this prophet was. I thought it was Moses. Because usually when we talk about the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, we talk about Moses. This is the man that led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, led them through the wilderness for 40 years. He's the man that went up on Mount Sinai and brought down the Ten Commandments carved by God. Then he personally broke them and had to go back up there and carve them himself. He brought the rest of the law with him. He, um, he was there for all of that. But that's not the prophet they're talking about right here. However, they are right to expect someone who's the prophet, don't have a name, we don't know who he is, but we know he's coming, Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is one of the first five books of the Bible, and it is, um, it's one of those five books that we attribute to Moses, that he wrote down the, the history of how the world was created and then the law was given. And we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Uh, Katie, I'm on page 161, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now here he's been talking about laws and regulations for the priests and the Levites. And then he talks a little bit about abominable practices, like what kinds of religious things you're not allowed to do, sorcery, uh, fortune telling, those kinds of things. Then he starts to talk about prophets in verse 15. And Alyssa, it's your turn. If you will read for me Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through um, how about 19? 15 through 19. Okay. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, 
Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Very good. So here, he's talking about a prophet who will come like Moses. So it's not Moses. It's not a reincarnation or a resurrection or just a return of Moses. This is someone who they already knew was going to come like Moses. Now, they've taken a proper interpretation in this case. They're not expecting the literal Moses to come. It's the prophet. That's how they begin to refer to this person. They're looking for him and expecting him. Ultimately, this prophet that they're looking for is Christ. And if we were to turn over to the book of Acts, we see multiple places in some of the sermons in the book of Acts where um, Peter and Paul refer to this prophet who they were been looking for, that that person is Jesus, and now he has come. So it's not Moses. This person ultimately is Jesus. And so when they asked, uh, when they asked John, are you the prophet? I'm back in John chapter 1. He answers very simply, no. And he doesn't want to, again, he doesn't want to get into it. He, he doesn't want to tell them anything that they don't understand. And so now they're frustrated. In verse 22, they say to him, well, who are you? We, look, we need to give an answer to the people who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Give us something that we can take back. All right, we've been sent as messengers. We can't go back empty-handed. And so here, it's sort of like they started out kind of curious about his identity. Well, maybe you're the Christ. Maybe you're Elijah. Maybe you're the prophet. And every time he said no, and now they just, look, I don't really care who you are. I just want you to tell me something so that I can go back to my boss and give him an answer. And he finally now takes the opportunity to tell them something about himself. And he says in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, again, he doesn't say, my name's John. He doesn't say who his mama and daddy were or why he's authorized to come and do these things. He points them back to an almost obscure piece of scripture in the book of Isaiah and says, that's who I am. Well, for us to understand that, let's turn back to Isaiah and see what he's talking about. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. That's on page 599 in my Bible. Isaiah chapter 40. And he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 3. But I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. So is everybody there in Isaiah chapter 40? Good. Okay. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Ultimately, John is claiming that this person who's preparing the way is himself. And what's the picture here? The picture here is that you've got mountains in the area and you've got these valleys and you've got rough patches like this and he's coming along and just going and making it flat and smooth. The picture here that he's pointing to is, is, is in that day, in that, in that time, there was a queen um, of ancient people in that area. And she liked to travel, but what she didn't like to do was to travel over the barren wilderness like common folk did. 
So that's kind of hard. You and I can just drive up and down mountains and it's not a big deal. But if you actually go out there and start hoofing it, or even if you took an animal, that's an arduous task. So she would send before her a team of people whose job was to level the place. They would take all the bumps in the road and fill them in. They would um, pave the parts that were too wet. If it was too tall, they would carve right through it. And that's what he's doing here. This, this queen that went that sent people before her everywhere she went, from town to town to city to city, she would leave a, a highway in her wake, a, a flat place for her to travel easily. That's what John's doing. He's preparing because there's a king who's coming behind him, who ranks before him, but is coming after him. And his job is to prepare the way for the king to come. So that's, when he's, that's why he's saying, repent and be baptized. The kingdom of God is at hand. There is a Messiah coming, and when he gets here, you better pay attention to him. He's trying to prepare their hearts. This flattening of what's happening on this road right here, that's what he's trying to do to the hearts of the children of Israel. So that's the reference that he makes. Now, if we flip back to John chapter 1, are they satisfied with that answer? They're, they're not satisfied with that answer. In verse 24, it says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. Now Pharisees, this is sort of like an interesting parenthetical remark that he makes here. The Pharisees were the experts in the law. These were the people that knew their Old Testament Bible backwards and forwards. They performed every single thing to the minute detail over and above because they also had commentaries um, and, and more commentaries where rabbis would have written down, well, if you really want to be great at this law, Here's all these different ways that you can accomplish that. They added to the law. That's how good they were at following the law. And because they wanted to be experts, they want to be clear now about who he is and his relationship to these claims that he's making. And so they said, all right, we've asked you who you are. You won't tell us. Then you tell us this thing. We don't totally understand. Let's talk about what we're really worried about. In verse 25, they ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I mean, if this was some new way that we're supposed to be doing things, why didn't you go through the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling court of the Jewish temple? Why didn't you come to the Pharisees and say, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be doing it this way? Why are you baptizing Jews? You're kind of making the claim that they're unclean, and that's not good. We're Pharisees. We know we're clean. Why do you say that we need to be cleaned? John likes to be cryptic. I don't think he really likes to be cryptic. I think he likes to be specific, but that it's difficult for them to understand him. In verse 26, his response is, I baptize with water. But basically, I'm not the one you should be worried about. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, I, I need to do some erasing here because this, this is great. He says, among you stands one you do not know. If it's somebody who's among them, it's somebody who they should have already noticed. He's saying, you should have already noticed. Now, he has already at this point, when they come to him and ask these questions, he's already baptized Jesus. We know that a little bit because um, in, the, the early, in the three other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, the story goes like this. Jesus came to John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, oh, 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 I can't baptize you. You should baptize me because he knows who he's talking to. Jesus says, no, to fulfill all righteousness, you need to baptize me. John baptizes him. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove and rests on Christ. And God speaks and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. It's, it's God the Father's testimony that Jesus is his son. Then Jesus immediately goes into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation. 
And that's important here because it's only after his return from that 40 days of uh, being in the wilderness that he begins to gather disciples. In John chapter 1, we see this conversation with um, the, those who were sent from the priests and the Levites. In verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he begins to describe what happened when he baptized Jesus as though it were in past tense. We'll, we'll talk more about that passage next week. And then in verse 35, it says, Then the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And those two disciples went and followed Christ. They were two of the first disciples that Jesus gathered. And so that 40-day period, it's not in here. All right? This is not a contradiction. What's happening is these folks have come to John after he baptized Jesus and after the 40 days of temptation in the wilderness and after Jesus has already come back and is among them. So he's saying, I've already borne witness to who Jesus is, and you didn't pay attention. There is someone among you, and yet you do not know him. This is um, a chastising. This is a, look, guys, you, you, you're worried about me. You shouldn't be worried about me, because my job was to point you to him, and you're not paying attention. Look to Christ. He then says, even he who comes after me, this is referring, because he's been using this language the whole time, that he comes after me, and yet he ranks before me. And then he says, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, sandals were not like the sandals we wear today. I mean, I wear like a Nike thong flip-flop sandal. You'll probably have seen Tevas that got the fancy straps, or the I used to wear leather sandals to church until they got so sweaty and stinky I couldn't wear them anywhere. Okay. So that's not what they wore. They wore, it was basically just like a flat piece of leather. I can draw this picture, a flat piece of leather like this with um, like a, a string or a strap that kind of went like that. Kind of this thing. Okay. Cheap looking thing. And they would walk through the dust and the dirt and the grime. The feet were the dirtiest part of their bodies. To wash somebody's feet is what slaves did. To carry somebody's shoes is what slaves did. And um, we see one curse in the Old Testament when we talk about kinsmen redeemers, where they would pull their shoe off and throw it at somebody. What an insult. This is the dirtiest part of my body, and I'm throwing it at you. And here, John says, I am not even worthy to untie his shoes. I'm not even worthy to be his slave. That's how much more important Christ is than I am. And you're worried about me? He says, you need to be looking to Christ. And that's the end of their conversation. It says these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. He's out there. They came all the way out there to Bethany to ask him these questions. And this is his testimony about Jesus and his relationship to Christ. So what do y'all think about that? What do y'all think about that? I mean, his answers to them were, were deliberate. They were short. They were not what they were expecting. And he, he continued to point to Christ in that. What do y'all think about that? I love the way that these answers, similar to Jesus' answers to other direct questions from the Pharisees, answer the question, but in this indirect way, so as also to fulfill the prophecy, seeing they would not see and hearing they would not understand. That he's laying it all out for them, but apart from the eyes of faith, they, they can't see it. It's this, there's a subtlety to it that's fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecy and... Um, you know, at the same time, he's not evading them, like you're saying. He's he's not refusing to answer. But I th I think sometimes we look at it and say, well, why didn't you just come out and just say it? Why why aren't you just telling them, laying it all out clearly? Um, and to to us, it it kind of looks extra opaque at times because I think that sometimes we don't have the context that the Pharisees should have had, like you're saying, they, they should have known better. Yeah. Um. These were Jews who had the benefit of the scriptures in their hands. They had the prophecies that pointed to Christ. And when he came, they went, you don't match up with our understanding of what this says. 
so you can't be the Messiah. And even here, they even go ask him, and, and he gives them answers that to us seem cryptic. You know, when we, uh, when we talk about sharing Jesus with the people around us, one of the things we try to do is make it really clear. But partly we need to take a little bit of example from John in this context. Each time they brought to him some reference to Old Testament prophecy, to something in Scripture that they had misinterpreted and misunderstood, he chose not to engage them at that level. These were experts in the law. These were experts in the scriptures. And he chose not to engage them because he only wanted to lay down the truth before them. And so um, I, I have a book written by, um, written by Charles Spurgeon. He's a guy that is some kind of called the Prince of Preachers. He preached in England for a long time um, and was... I mean, a really powerful preacher, especially if you read some of his sermons. And he taught there at the local uh, Bible college. And one of the things he liked to do was on Fridays, he would do a special series of lectures that was more of a practical rubber meets the road for young preachers. It wasn't high level. It wasn't learn the biblical languages. It wasn't deep theology. It was rubber meets the road. You're going to be a preacher. This is stuff you're going to need to know. And one of the things that he talked about was that sometimes somebody will come to you with a wrong understanding and they'll want to debate about it. They want to drag you into this debate about it. And he says, a Christian's job is not to debate about these issues. He says, our job is to lay down the truth. Let's say you brought me a crooked stick and you said, this stick is straight. And now I know it's crooked and I could spend all day trying to convince you that your stick is crooked. But that won't work. He says, my only job as a preacher, as a teacher, as somebody who's sharing the word with somebody else is to lay down a straight stick next to the crooked one, and then any fool can tell the difference. That one is clearly straight. And it's especially so in the context of scriptures. Just like Matt said, we need the Holy Spirit's help to help us understand spiritual things. So in the flesh, we're not going to understand these correctly. In our in our natural fallen selves, we're not going to understand this correctly. We need the help of the Spirit to illuminate it for us. And so if somebody comes to you that you're talking and, and, and trying to, to tell them about Christ and about what he's done for you, and they want to debate it, they want to get into these finer points, and they want to get caught up in the little bits, here it's okay to take an exam, take a page out of John the Baptist's book and just not engage them in that way. Turn it straight back to Christ. Who are you? No, 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 no. I'm not the Christ. That's all you need to know about me. Were well, you this guy? No, that's not what you think it is. So I'm just going to say no. Uh, well, how about this other one? No, that's still Jesus. So that's not me. Well, tell me about yourself. I prepare the way for Jesus. That's it. That's all he did in this conversation. And I think it's good for us to take an example from that. Other thoughts? Um, I did not realize that there was baptism going on um, even before John baptized Jesus, but it does make sense um, because in my mind, like the, the verse that I know about baptism so well, you know, Acts 2.38, um, but then when you pointed out, like, there was baptism going on in Jewish religion, I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I, I just kind of wonder, and this is probably, like, going off on a rabbit hole, but, like, what, who was John baptizing in the name of, you know, during, like, in this moment in John 1, when all these crowds are around him and he's baptizing, like, what is he saying? To yeah, people, so, you know, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to know the answer. Um, but it just kind of makes me wonder, like, oh, I wonder, I just wonder about that. Sure. So um, baptism is a, is, a, is a deep subject. I, as I was studying this, I've got um, some commentaries that I go through. And in this part where it started to reference baptism, he said, he said, now turn back to the end of my commentary on Matthew and read some observations on baptism. And I turned back there and found it, and it was page after page after page after page after page on just baptism. And I was like, 
I'm going to have to come back and read that again later because we're not going to have time to talk about that much about baptism. But here um, I can answer your question a little bit because there were some, um, there were some people and I'm next week, I'm going to come and actually tell you this actual verse so that you can read it for yourself. Um, in, I think it's in the book of Acts. They came upon some people that, said they had been baptized and they said, well, did you, which baptism did you have? John's baptism or were you baptized in the name of Christ? And they said, well, we just had John's baptism. And so in a sense there, John's baptism is what we usually call a baptism of repentance. And then when you're baptized as a Christian, um, we usually just recall, we just call that baptism. What John was doing was for a short time, that this was a preparatory thing, that this was to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers to their children. He was bringing healing to the, to the nation of Israel to bring them back into a, a moral state where they were looking for a Messiah. Um, this baptism of repentance was not one that conferred grace. Guess what? The mm -hmm. baptism that we do as Christians does not confer grace to you. It is a sign and a symbol of something that's happened. So John's baptism was a sign that they had repented. Baptism mm -hmm. um, into Christ's name is a sign of something that's already happened. And what's happened is the new birth that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that you've now been saved. It, this is something that happens after you're a believer. You then go and are baptized. Um, so that's, I would say, is the, the difference there, that he didn't baptize them into somebody's name, that instead it was repent and then be baptized as a public profession of your repentance. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Cool. Very good question. Well, if there aren't any further questions, then we can actually finish on time today. Yay. Um, would somebody like to close us in prayer then? If not, I'm happy to do that. Y'all bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a wonderful God. As we study these scriptures and we see the purpose and the determination and the clarity with which John understood his calling to point people to Christ, he did some things that we don't normally think of as being the right way to do things the way that he didn't engage them in one area of the conversation so that he could only point to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would instill that desire in our hearts that as we would look out uh, to the rest of the world, to the people that we work with, to the people that we're friends with, to members of our own family, that we would see them as, as, as lost people ripe for the harvest, that there are people out there that you intend to save, there are people out there that you intend to make your children and that you've called us to a very high calling of being the means by which they can learn and understand and put their faith in the gospel, because that's the only, that, that's the only way that they can be saved from the wrath to come. Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness and confidence in that, that you would give us wisdom to speak always in gentleness and respect, that we're going to talk to people that, that don't understand, we're going to talk to people who think they understand, and that in every way that we would show the love of Christ in our conversation and in our behavior. Amen. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, as always, for running it. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Well, I've been having fun. <laughs> It's, all, it's interesting. I didn't want to derail anything, but I am interested to, to hear more of your thoughts on baptism and, and the differences between John's baptism and, and Christ's. Because um, I know that that's, you know, that's a doctrinal thing, not to make it about denominations or anything, but uh, I, I'm always interested to hear your thoughts, uh, particularly coming from a Baptist perspective, on what baptism represents. So. If that happens to work its way into studies, then I'm eager to learn. Um, I'm trying to think if it will come in here. 
Um, and if not, that's okay too. But yeah, I'm trying to think of where it, it would come in anywhere in the rest of John, but it may not. We, and we can always just talk about those things. Yeah. Um, I will say this, that um, something that the evangelical church as a whole agrees on is that baptism is not the means by which you're saved. Right. Uh, the, the water in the baptismal is tap water. It, it, it comes out of the same water that comes into my house. Uh, there's nothing about it that's, that's magical that uh, actually washes away sin. That whether you do it, whether you're sprinkled as a baby, or you do it when you're a believer and you get dunked in the water, if you're in a Baptist church, um, that in either case, that it's a sign and a seal of the reality. It's not, yeah. it, it's not the thing that does it. It's a sign and a seal of the thing that does it. And that the thing that actually does it is the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's where we can come together as Christians and, and cherish, knowing that Jesus really only gave us two ordinances. Um, if you're in a, a Presbyterian church or a Reformed church, sometimes that's called sacraments. Both of those are good words. One's looking at it from a covenantal perspective. One's looking at it from a, uh, Jesus gave us some things to do. That's why we say ordinances. Um, but in both cases, we've got baptism and the Lord's Supper. And between those two and reading your Bible and praying, that's what we call the common means of grace. That this is the way that we come to know God. This is the way that we publicly profess that we know Christ um, and our relationship to him. And these are just the ordinary, ordinary things that churches do. So, um, cool. Cool. Well, we'll talk yeah. more about that whenever you want to. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. No, it's, it's interesting because I, knowing them as the means of grace, like you're saying, um, you know, there, there's some hair to split in there, fine, fine line in terms of conferring grace. Like I agree completely. The baptism is not saving you. The baptism, mm -hmm. the water is not doing it. It's describing something that already exists. But that, that sign and that seal is a visible representation that God gives us to remind us of that grace. And so we would say that in that sense, you are receiving grace. It's not the saving, you know, it's not the, the kind of saving grace that's salvation. It's not magically changing anything, but it's, it's like participating in the Lord's Supper. We, we consider it a means of grace because it's this visible reminder, this, this tangible thing that God gives us to remind us of what's true. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's good. Very cool. All right. Well, I promised to finish on time, so let's wrap it up. Thank you all very awesome. much for coming. And uh, Thanks, Scott. I'll see you again next week. And if, if I, I haven't said this before, if we've talked about something today and you're reading back over it, or if you've got a question about anything that you're studying in the Bible, or you went to church and the preacher said something and you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. A, you should always go talk to your preacher about it. But if you just want to talk about any of these things or ask me, you can just come ask me. You don't have to wait till Fridays at 1.30. You can just talk about it. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. All right. See you have later. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your week.